This program, while curated to help you improve your health, contains general advice and should not replace the individual advice of your medical practitioner. Can you tell me about your own personal health story? Catherine, I'm, 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 it's terrible to tell you that I have had virtually everything. Tell me a bit more about wheat's effect on blood sugar and insulin. So we've been told that complex carbohydrates are better for us. This is nonsense. Do you think it's a, a cultural systematic problem or do you think it's a problem with the individual physicians? I think it's both. In life, it's normal to have ups and downs. But what do we do when we get stuck? I've always been fascinated by the healing journey. Why do some people get better while others fail to make the shift? Welcome to the Expert Series, where you'll meet 25 of the world leaders in health and wellness, discussing their passions and what it takes to make your shift. There's an electrical feeling in the room. I had to be a mom. It was so important to me. I've always been a pain in the butt, and I love that. I knew that I wanted to help people. I'm Catherine Maslin, and this is The Shift. Hi, I'm Catherine Maslin, naturopath, author, and host of The Shift. In the expert series, we share the insights, stories, and expertise of each of our amazing experts. You might have met them on season one of The Shift, where we took snippets of these conversations and put them together into the series. If you haven't listened to season one yet, I'd recommend going back and listening to episode one on what it takes to make a shift in your gut health. We'll provide a link in the show notes. In this episode of the Expert Series, we have the wonderful Dr. William Davis. Dr. Davis is an American cardiologist and author of six books, including his New York Times bestselling book, Wheat Belly and Undoctored. Dr. William Davis has been a pioneer when it comes to raising awareness about the dangers of gluten, wheat, big food and its effect on our health. He's been a cardiologist for over 20 years, with most of his career spent in the mainstream medical model. After overcoming his own health issues using diet and lifestyle modifications, Dr. Davis became passionate about helping patients to prevent cardiovascular disease and other conditions by modifying their diet rather than turning to drugs. Dr. William Davis has discussed his views on many major media outlets, including The Dr. Oz Show and Fox TV, and he's been featured in The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, The Huffington Post, amongst others. He is a passionate advocate for preventative healthcare, and I can't wait to share this extended conversation with you. For more, listen to season one of The Shift, where Dr. Davis is featured across many episodes. Listen out for how Dr. Davis made his transition from the mainstream medical doctor into a holistic model of care, and of course, his opinions on wheat and gluten. First up, I asked him to introduce himself and tell me where he was from. William Davis, Fox Point, Wisconsin, uh, and I used to practice cardiology, but now I practice health, which is very distinct from cardiology and medicine, by the way. Tell me, how is it distinct? So the practice of health, Catherine, is entirely different because what healthcare has become in the U.S. is the delivery of procedures and pharmaceuticals, not health. So no one no one obtains health in the U.S. by going to the doctor or going to the hospital. That's the great tragedy here, that if you want to be a non-diabetic, if you don't want to have high blood pressure, if you don't want to have irritable bowel syndrome, if you don't want to have ulcerative colitis or migraine headaches, don't go to the doctor because all they dispense is are pharmaceuticals and procedures because that's how revenue-driven healthcare works now. It's bad worldwide, but it's the worst in the U.S., where there's this distinct need for driving revenues for health care. But the real truth is you can obtain astounding levels of health far superior to what you obtain through the health care system on your own. So I'm a naturopath and I totally agree with you. And a lot of the kickback has been traditionally from people outside of medicine, but we're starting to see now more people like you that are kind of coming forward and going, there's actually a better way. What's your opinion going through medical school and having done all of that? How did you end up at this conclusion? Catherine, I, I started out as a poor kid. We had the Salvation Army uh, charities bringing me Christmas presents on Christmas because we didn't have food nor Christmas tree nor gifts. So I started from that. I put myself through 17 years of education and training, ended up in a lot of debt, 
But I was really proud of what I did. I got to be a practicing physician. I trained in cardiology. It took many years of effort. And I realized within a few years how stupid it was. But the turning point for me was the death of my mom, who died of sudden cardiac death about four months after her successful two-vessel coronary angioplasty. So she got two vessels dilated via angioplasty and died suddenly in her bed. But it drove home to me how pointless, how silly, how useless it was to just address this disease, coronary disease, in a procedure lab, in a cath lab, by dilating people's arteries or putting stents in or doing atherectomy and all those fancy procedures that I, I did morning till night. So I set myself on a course to identify a better way to identify early coronary disease. Well, this is 20 some years ago. Back then, as now, the only way to identify early coronary disease is via a CT heart scan. So we're talking about healthy, normal people going to work, taking care of their kids, not people in a procedure lab, not people who are having a procedure, just healthy, everyday people. So accountants, teachers, engineers, business people coming in for a heart scan, they get a score, a heart scan score, normal to zero. They would have a score, say, of 500. Well, what do you do with that? They're terrified. Now they know they have coronary disease. They'd say things like, well, I'm 52. My dad had a fatal heart attack at 55. Am I set in the same path? What do you do about that? Well, 20 some years ago, I'd put that person aspirin, a statin drug like Lipitor, a low fat diet, exercise, everything moderation. What happens when you do that? The score goes up 25% per year. It's horrible. What happens if you do nothing? Don't do any of that stuff. It goes up 25% per year. In other words, the conventional answers for coronary disease have no effect at all. What do you do if the conventional answers do nothing? Well, you have to find solutions. That's what I did. It took me years to figure out, but it led to things like wheat and grain elimination because if you don't do cholesterol testing, this ridiculous outdated technology called cholesterol testing, but you do what's the real test, lipoprotein testing. You eliminate wheat and grains and it goes to zero or something close to zero, very low number. In other words, it's eliminated, it's obliterated by a diet free of wheat and grains. So I did this for coronary risk because of small LDL particles. The real cause of heart disease, not LDL cholesterol, that's the big pharma version that allows them to sell you statin drugs. So eliminate small LDL particles down to zero or something close to that. And people come back and they said to me, you didn't tell me I would become a non-diabetic and I have to stop my insulin and diabetes drugs. My blood sugar was too low. You didn't tell me I'd lose 47 pounds in three months. You didn't tell me that my eczema, psoriasis, and separate would go away. You didn't tell me my irobalcin would be gone in a week. Why did my ulcerative colitis go away? Why did my Crohn's disease go away? Why did my lupus rash go away? I don't understand why I'm no longer depressed. Why is my health so transformed? Because became clear that I had stumbled on something for coronary reasons that was so unexpected, so huge, that I wanted to understand what the hell is going on here? Why, if you remove the food that every government agency tells you is essential to your health, why would we remove it and people are transformed in health and weight? Why? And that's why I started to track down all the reasons why and that led to the whole Weebilly experience. As a doctor then, how did it make you feel having people coming back and not getting better from your care when you were doing the conventional model? Medicine makes its money by doing the wrong thing. Best thing for a cardiologist is you have a heart attack or you have angina, chest pain, or heart failure. The best thing for an oncologist is that you have lung cancer, or ovarian cancer, or uterine cancer. In other words, healthcare is driven by tragedy and bad outcomes. John Q. Primary Care likes you to be sick. That's the tragedy of healthcare. It's intent on having you be sick and doesn't even know how to make you healthy. They don't know how to get your triglycerides down. They don't know how to get rid of fatty liver in two weeks. So I started to realize quickly that what we do in conventional healthcare is so dramatically wrong and that there really are easy answers out there. Do you think it's a, a cultural systematic problem or do you think it's a problem with the individual physicians? I think it's both. I have a lot of friends who are still you know, doctors who are friends, despite all the nasty things I say. And they tell me, Bill, 
I'm an employee of the hospital system. They're a large hospital system, typically, you know, four, five, ten different hospitals all in a single system. Well, my colleagues are employees of these systems, and they're told, doctor, the more revenue you drive, the larger your end of quarter bonus, such that the more MRIs, surgical consultations, um, tilt studies, heart catheterizations, uh, appendectomies, uh, et cetera, you drive, the larger your bonus. The difference is, say, $0 and maybe $50,000 at the end of the quarter. So what do you think my colleagues do? They drive revenues like mad. They see a nice person who's got good health insurance, and they they churn that person for procedures. I've seen it happen so many times, it's shameful. I see people going in for shoulder pain because they were gardening in the springtime. They're unaccustomed to physical effort because of a sedentary winter. And they end up with a heart catheterization, an electrophysiologic study, an MRI, $140,000, $150,000 worth of tests for shoulder pain that could have been managed easily with none of those things. But that's what's driving healthcare now. And in the US, it's really bad because we also have the proliferation of direct to consumer drug advertising, which is about 50% or more of all advertising revenue for big media. So now big media, ABC, NBC, CBS, cable TV, have all become uncomfortable with broadcasting real news about health because it could alienate their advertising. So what happened to you once you started stepping outside of the box and speaking out about this stuff? My colleagues were confused. They didn't understand. So I had hospital administrators come to me and said, Dr. Davis, where are you taking all your patients? Nobody was coming to the hospital for procedures. Nobody's coming to the hospital with heart failure or heart attacks. They said, where, where are you taking your patients now? I said, here. And they said, well, I, we don't understand. You have so few hospitalizations. You must be taking them someplace else. I no, my patients don't get sick. They don't have. They have no angina. They have no heart attacks. They laughed. They thought I was joking. They didn't believe me. That's typically what happens, because when you tell somebody a message that says essentially, what you do is wrong, all this this entire hospital, this eighty million dollar wing you have for cardiovascular health is silly. It's unnecessary. You don't need this. They don't want to hear it. It's like the tobacco industry all over again. If you say, you know, smoking cigarettes causes lung cancer and heart disease, and you know that you pay your mortgage because big tobacco pays your salary, they don't want to hear it. Same thing in healthcare. They don't want to hear that what they do is silly and useless. All right. I'm going to just get a little bit of backstory, if that's okay. Can you tell me where were you born? Yokohama, Japan. Ah, and tell me what, what happened then? My mom married an army guy in the army, and they moved to New Jersey, where he was from. And I, so I grew up in New Jersey, so on the East Coast. You, so did you grow up in New Jersey? Yeah, I grew up a poor kid in New Jersey, a single mom, two sisters. And, um, I mean, we were poor people. We, you know... The teacher would donate the Christmas tree from the class so I could have a Christmas tree. Salvation Arm would bring us food. I mean, we were really poor. So when I did finally get into medicine, I was really pretty proud of what I'd done. I really did 17 years of, of, of college and training. And when it finally dawned on me that what I did was wrong, that I spent 17 years learning something that was just plain wrong, that this was a system created for profit not to dispense health. It was very painful. And you know what? I had a procedural practice. Uh, morning till night, I did procedures, heart procedures, often seven days a week. And I was good at it. That's what brought me here was uh, a hospital system brought me in to uh, upgrade the procedural practices here. And I taught numerous other doctors how to do procedures, better procedures, more advanced procedures, only to realize what I did was silly and unnecessary. How did you feel when you made that realization? Confused. What do you do when you're really good at something and you realize it's pointless? So it took me some years to unwind all that. It kind of solved itself because what happened was I went from a practice where I was seeing a few heart attacks every week, even though among people taking statin drugs and following a low-fat diet, this is 20-some years ago, to where I took them off their grains, took them off their statin drugs, 
introduce vitamin D, have them take fish oil, cultivate bowel flora, all those kinds of things that we're doing now. And I saw heart attacks, chest pains, heart failure, need for bypass surgery, need for heart catheterization and stents, et cetera, drop to virtually zero. And so I went from doing five, six, eight procedures a day to no procedures. And so it kind of solved itself. That is just by dispensing health advice, people were no longer needing any procedures. They weren't having chest pain. They weren't having heart attacks. So it kind of closed down the practice for me. And all I was doing is telling people, don't eat grains, take 6,000 units of vitamin D in an oil-based gel cap, take this probiotic, make sure you get sufficient prebiotic fibers, supplement magnesium because you're drinking filtered water, those kinds of basic things. And nobody was having a heart attack. And so my procedure practice essentially closed itself down. Where did you study medicine? I went to school, a medical school at St. Louis University, uh, which was a very good place. And I was very, very grateful for the education I got there. Uh, and I was really proud. I used to think, you know, here I am wearing a white coat and having a stethoscope and going to the operating room and going to cath lab procedures. And I thought, this is great. Until I realized, I, I got trained in the age of what was called ECIC bypass, extracranial intracranial bypass. There was a procedure that was done many times a day in any neurosurgical operating room where if you had a stroke, they would take the extracranial artery on your scalp, drill a hole in your skull, this is true, and connect it to an intracerebral vessel, ECIC bypass. So you'd have this artery connecting the scalp into a brain artery. Then it was proven, a large study was conducted that against the sham procedure, there was no benefit at all. So I was in a center where they were doing this four, five, six, seven times a day for many thousands of dollars. It was proven to be completely ridiculous. But that was my first hint that medicine was not about health. It was about how to drive profit from poor health. Want to look deeper into your own health? Our virtual naturopathic team help people from all over the world to shift their health and their life. We offer a 90-minute online discovery and diagnostic session where you can find out where you're at, why you're here, and what you need to do about it. Everyone is so unique, and sometimes it can help to have someone break down your journey and see where it is that you need to head next. To find out more, go to theshiftclinic.com and click on Shift With Us. So then you graduated medicine and then you went on to continue your study. What did you do? So I trained in internal medicine at Ohio State University. I did uh, a couple of years of cardiology there. And then I did more advanced training in angioplasty and uh, advanced uh, coronary techniques at a hospital in the Case Western Reserve University system in Cleveland, Ohio. And that's where I became director of the fellowship and director of the cath lab. So I taught many of my colleagues how to do advanced procedures. That's the irony of my life, that I taught my colleagues, many of them, how to do advanced coronary procedures that I now recognize as being largely useless, pointless, and unnecessary. You know, I kind of have goosebumps when you talk about that because it's thinking about how you must have felt in that moment going, you know, was this all a waste of time? But I don't think it was a waste of time because without that background and that credibility and having been there and done that, there's no way that you could come with this strong position like you are now going, this is actually how it is. Without a, a doctor doing that, it's just sort of, you know, kind of chewed away, I guess. True. You know, it was the death of my mom of sudden cardiac, cardiac death after her two-vessel angioplasty that really kind of turned the corner for me because I was deep in the procedure world then. But I, I said, well, you know, this is ridiculous. My mom dies of the disease I take care of every day. And I, I was helpless. I, she was in New Jersey at the time and I was in Wisconsin. But it drove home to me that what I did was ineffective. You can't stop that person from dying at home. So I said, well, what can we do to identify someone like my mom years before that happens? Well, then and now, the only technique to do that is a CT heart scan that gives you something called a coronary calcium score. You use calcium as an indirect index of the amount of atherosclerotic plaque in your arteries. And it's very effective. If you have 
2 cubic millimeters of calcium, you have 10 cubic millimeters of atherosclerotic plaque. It's a very easy equation that calcium offers you an indirect index of atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries. The coronaries, the heart moves, it has multiple phases of motion, so you have to have a really fast CT scanner. Back then it was an electron beam device, now it's what's called multi-detector CT scans. And these are just rapid CT scans that can allow you to image the coronary arteries and quantify the calcium. Well, I did this 20 some years ago. We got the first scanner in Wisconsin, one of the first scanners in all the Midwest, and we started scanning people left and right, thousands of people. And so every day people are coming through, they say things like, my mom had a heart attack at 63, I'm 55, do I have heart disease? I feel good, I exercise, I watch my cholesterol. 55 year old woman has a heart scan score of 300. Yes, you have heart disease, what do you do? Well, if you do nothing, the score increases. Plaque grows by 25% per year. So a year later, a score of 300 becomes 375, right? A year after that, 400 something, and then you get closer to heart attack and death every time that happens. Well, if we put that person on a low-fat diet, Lipitor, aspirin, all those conventional things, score increases by 25% per year, has no effect. So what do you do? All these people freaking out on me, thousands of them here. Well, the consensus opinion was don't repeat the scan, let them have a heart attack, no joke. That was a consensus opinion, or let them have symptoms so that you can justify bypass surgery or three stents or whatever. Well, that's a lousy answer. So I set myself on a course to find out, find better ways to put a stop to this increasing uh, growth of atherosclerotic plaque as followed by heart scan scores. Well, it led to things like no wheat, no grains, because that, that's what causes the most common cause for coronary disease, small LDL particles. It led to restoration of vitamin D, which by the way, was the first time, when I added vitamin D many years ago, it was the first time I saw heart scan scores go from say 700 to 300. You saw dramatic regression, in addition to the restoration of mood, clarity of thought, increased bone density, reversal of insulin resistance, all the marvelous effects of restoring vitamin D, particularly in this climate, right, where it's cold. Even if you go outside now in January, you can't get enough sun. The sun's too weak. You're wearing clothes. You're wearing almost all your skin surface air is covered. And so restoring vitamin D was astounding. So the real turning point was, ironically, the death of my mother from the disease that I took care of every day. What did you do once your mom died? What steps did you take to kind of change what you were doing? So it started with asking myself, well, how do you identify someone like my mom? Not the day before the heart attack, so they need a procedure, but let's say five years before their heart attack becomes. There was a, a TV personality in the US named Tim Russert. He was very famous. This goes back some years now, but he was the host of a, of a news show. A smart guy, very smart guy. Well, he had a heart scan and his score was 550. He went to his doctor and the doctor says, that's a stupid test. Don't pay any attention to it. Take your Lipitor, take your aspirin, take your beta blocker and exercise every day. Russert follows that advice. He takes his drugs. He bikes on a stationary bike every day and dropped dead five years later on his TV set. When his score, if you do the simple math, if 550 increases by 25 to 30% per year, he died with a score of about 1,800. When your heart scan score exceeds 1,000, your risk for death or heart attack is about 10 to 15% per year. In other words, his doctor was given a crystal ball that said, Mr. Russert will die of a heart attack, sudden cardiac death, or have angel symptoms that will cause him to have a heart procedure, virtually guaranteed in five years. And his doctor chose to ignore it and put him on a regimen that has no effect whatsoever on the progression of heart disease. That is the status quo now. But that's what changed. Those are the kinds of things that change what I do. Realizing that telling somebody, maybe you'll come in for a procedure in five years. That's my answer. In the meantime, take a statin drug, aspirin, beta blocker, cut your fat. That is no better than doing nothing. Can you tell me about your own personal health story? Catherine, I'm, 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 it's terrible to tell you that I have had virtually everything. I was a type 2 diabetic. I had irritable bowel syndrome. I had eczema. I had uh, fatigue, overweight, 
high triglycerides, low HDL cholesterol, small LDL. I mean, you name it, I had it. SIBO. <laughs> but it also illustrated to me how powerful it is to correct these things with no medication, without a uh, conventional doctor telling you you need Prilosec or Lipitor, that you have astounding control over. Not to say there aren't unexpected health. Of course there are. But they're in the minority. The vast majority of modern health conditions are completely reversible with natural, everyday means. I think it started when I made myself a type 2 diabetic. This is about 20, I think, three years ago or so, maybe 25 years ago. And I heard Dr. Dean Ornish speak. He's the guy who claims to have reversed heart disease with a vegetarian, low-fat diet. And by the way, that's, that's nonsense. He did not. He misinterpreted his data. He used a flawed method of, of tracking atherosclerosis. So he thought at the time, and I bought it at first, that he claimed to have reversed heart disease. And I heard him speak in Atlanta at the American uh, College of Cardiology meetings. So I thought, I'm going to try that myself. I'm going to become a vegetarian, super low fat, so no added oils, no meats. And I gained 30 pounds. My triglycerides went as high as 390 my HDL dropped to 27, and I had fasting blood sugars in the 160 range. I became a type 2 diabetic, being vegetarian and low fat. It illustrated to me just how wrong you can go in diet, how far off course you can go. And I was jogging, by the way, three, four, five miles a day, and I became a diabetic and had all these problems, and hypertension, by the way. So it illustrated to me how awful you can health can get by doing the wrong thing, by doing such things as becoming vegetarian or going low fat. So I stopped doing all the things and I started to explore what exactly was wrong with that lifestyle, why you shouldn't cut fat, why including animal products is essential for this carnivorous species called homo sapiens, etc. Now I'm no longer diabetic. I don't have irritable bowel syndrome. I don't have eczema. I have a triglyceride level in the 40s. My HDL went from 27 to good, went from 27 to 94, which is supposed to be impossible. For many years, I consulted in what's called complex hyperlipidemias. These are complex disorders of cholesterol values. I consulted for years on people who had HDLs of 10, triglycerides of 2,000, and weird things like that. And it became clear that people have astounding control over those factors, and it doesn't involve drugs. You wrote a book called Undoctored. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So it all started with the wheat belly conversation, where I was eliminating wheat and grains and seeing astounding things happen in people's health, and then correcting deficiencies that persisted even after grain elimination, such as magnesium deficiency, and correcting other common deficiencies of modern life, like vitamin D deficiency, because all of us insist on wearing clothes in public. So wheat and grain elimination combined with a small collection of nutrient restoration, and you see astounding things happen. But this is what led to the undoctored conversation. People would do this, and the doctor would say, that's stupid. If you do that, if you eliminate wheat and grains, and eat more fat, etc., you're going to have heart disease, you're going to have a heart attack. Well, people did it anyway. They'd come back to the doctor, 63 pounds lighter, off diabetes medications, no longer having acid reflux or ulcerative colitis, a whole long list of other health conditions. And the doctor would be completely dumbfounded. But what I saw was that people were doing this on their own, despite the doctor, despite the mainstream doctor, that these people were getting healthy, slender, younger, despite the blundering of the doctor. So what I saw was that we had stumbled on a process that allows everyday people to get rid of numerous health conditions. Not all of them, maybe only 90% of health conditions, like type 2 diabetes and hypertension, on their own, undoctored. So some of my colleagues got mad at me. They said, how dare you suggest to people that they diagnose their own health conditions and treat it? That's not what Undoctor is about. Undoctor is about this idea that just by simply correcting a number of factors in modern life, like wheat and grain consumption, vitamin D deficiency, and cultivation of healthy bowel flora, you have astounding, huge control over health, such that you can reverse literally hundreds of health conditions. And the doctor will have no idea what it is you're doing because their business is not health. It's dispensing drugs and scheduling you for procedures and having you see specialists that have nothing to do with health. So health has become the province of everyday people. And the truth is, 
As you know, people have astounding control of their own health, but the doctor will have no idea what it is you're doing. Do you see in the future that doctors need to be that primary health provider and know all the nutrition or that they just need to learn to collaborate with other people that know this stuff and guide people in the right direction? I've stopped hoping that everyday mainstream doctors will ever get it because there's no money in getting it right. I tell people, become useless to the healthcare system by being healthy. In other words, I see this happen every day. If you are healthy with normal blood pressure, low triglycerides, normal blood sugar, normal hemoglobin A1C, you look good, you feel good, the doctor gets upset with you. Like you need Lipitor or you need to take aspirin or you need to be told to take this or that. In other words, the system is not designed to help you become healthy. I've lost hope that mainstream doctors will ever do that. Maybe I'll be wrong in 50 years, but it's not going to happen by Tuesday. And so that's why I think what you're doing, what the naturopath community, the integrative health community, the functional medicine doctor community, the the people who understand that health is not something you get by a prescription. It's, It's what you obtain by diet, how you conduct your life, how you sleep, all those kinds of natural things. That's what really matters, but there's no money in that. And that's the big dilemma here. If this episode is leaving you wanting more, I'll be hosting a live webinar on gut health. Join me and get the opportunity to get your gut health questions answered. Go to theshiftclinic.com forward slash webinar. See you there. The Shift! So tell me a bit more about wheat's effect on blood sugar and insulin comparative to sugars and other carbohydrates. So we've been told that complex carbohydrates, that is long chain carbohydrates, are better for us than simple sugars like sucrose or table sugar. This is nonsense. Look at any table of glycemic index. So you don't have to take my word for it. Look at any table of glycemic index in any nutrition book, any published study, and you'll see over and over again, thousands of times corroborated, that wheat raises blood sugar higher than table sugar, has a higher glycemic index. And Whole wheat flour products raise blood sugar higher than even white flour products. So this whole business of complex carbohydrates from grains are better for you is complete nonsense. They raise blood sugar higher than eating just plain sugar or candy. And so we've been told that we should fill our meals with grains, especially whole grains. What we've been told then is meant to raise blood sugar to high levels every meal. So it should come as no surprise that there's an epidemic of type 2 diabetes and obesity on a scale never before seen in human history caused by nutritional guidelines. And the sad story is that in the U.S., many of the countries, the U.K., Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, have adopted, have followed what we've been saying here, and they now see this as law, as fact, that grains are necessary for health, but the exact opposite is true. Grains are horrible for health. They cause type 2 diabetes or contribute in a large way to type 2 diabetes. And a lot of this was caused by national dietary guidelines. Where do these guidelines come from? A lot of these guidelines come from the U.S. Dietary Guidelines for Americans. That comes from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and other similar agencies based on Poor interpretation of the science, some very bad science, and the influence of industry. You know, the USDA, to their credit, whenever they have to issue dietary guidelines, they open it to public conversation. And they actually have a period of, uh, say, 10 days or so where the entire debate is open to the public. But people like you and me don't attend those meetings in Bethesda, Maryland. It's big industry that does. They pay people to participate in these conversations. So in effect, industry has influenced the message of the USDA, the American Heart Association, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the American Diabetes Association, and thereby, unfortunately, much of the dietary policy of the rest of the world because they listen to these things. Yet it was crafted by industry, not by science. And there's a lot of bad science out there too. There's uh, a lot of what's called observational data So observational data would be, I say, Catherine, tell me what you ate today. Fill out this questionnaire, and in 20 years, we'll predict if you have ovarian cancer or heart disease, we'll base your risk on what you ate today. That's an observational study. 
a true clinical study would be, I say, Catherine, eat these foods and do this for the next 10 years and we'll see what happens to you in your health. That's the real way to perform science. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to perform that kind of science. So a lot of the lessons in, in diet came from observational data, which is close to no data at all. Four times out of five, observational data proves wrong, yet the USDA and other agencies have relied on places like the Harvard School of Public Health, which publishes oodles of observational data that's essentially garbage. And that's why you hear these ridiculous headlines like red meat causes cancer and all that kind of nonsense. It's based on observational garbage data. But they make no distinction. The American Heart Association just issued, reissued, reiterated its stand on saturated fat, total fat, and cholesterol, even though the science is clear, the real science, not the observational data, the real science is clear. Dietary cholesterol, saturated fat, total fat intake has nothing to do with heart disease. Why do you think people have such trouble and such emotion over giving up wheat? So we have to accept that in wheat is a protein called gliadin. And gliadin, so like all components of the seeds of grasses, we're unable to enzymatically digest them and break them down. So if I eat an egg or a pork chop, I break down the proteins into single amino acids. That's how we're supposed to consume proteins. If you consume the proteins in the in grains, seeds of grasses, you can't digest them. You can't break them down. So the gliadin protein of wheat is broken down into small pieces, but not amino acids. Peptides, four or five amino acids long. And these small peptides have opioid properties, oddly. They bind to the opioid receptors of the human brain. They don't make you high. They cause addictive eating behavior. They cause addictive relationships with food. It causes uh, behavioral outbursts in kids with ADHD and autism. It causes uh, auditory hallucinations and hearing voices in people with paranoid schizophrenia. It causes 24-hour day food obsessions in people with bulimia and, and binge eating disorder. In everyday people without those conditions, it causes uh, increased appetite and desire to eat more food. That's why people who consume grains will tell you they have a big plate of spaghetti and they're stuffed and they're almost painfully stuffed, but they're still hungry. It's unnatural to have that kind of incessant appetite. Lose the grains and all that goes away. You have breakfast, say three eggs and some bacon or whatever at 7 a.m., you might be hungry by 3 or 4 p.m. if you're hungry at all. In other words, you're freed from that ab abnormal appetite triggering that big food knows all about, by the way. And I believe that that's the reason why wheat products and related grain products are in virtually all processed foods now. Because big food came to understand probably in the mid-1980s that including grains in every food drives appetite up. It drives up calorie consumption 400, 1,800, 1,500 calories per person per day and thereby drives profits. But if you understand that, if you go grain-free and consume those seeds of grasses, you are freed from an astounding amount of appetite and you can cruise through your day and never be hungry. Can you tell me what has been the biggest shift that you can remember in your life? I think the biggest shift was realizing, when, Catherine, when I, when I first saw the, the enormity of the effect of eliminating wheat and grains, I refused to believe it. I said, there's no way. How can removing the food that every dietitian, every doctor, every agency agrees must dominate your diet, how can removing that thing yield astounding health? I, I, there must be something wrong with me. I'm not seeing something here. So when I did the background work for the Wheat Belly books, I every day I expected to be proven wrong. I expected to uncover something. And I would slap myself in the head and say, I didn't realize that. I'm, I'm the dumbass here <laughs> that I got it wrong. The exact opposite happened. The deeper I dug, the worse it got. That is the case against consuming wheat and grains by humans got worse and worse and worse. And what was astounding was this science is already out there. I didn't do those studies. I just uncovered and put it all together that we know that wheat and grains 
contribute to type 2 diabetes. We know that wheat and grains are the trigger for type 1 diabetes in kids and rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune conditions. We know that wheat and grains cause eczema and psoriasis and migraine headaches and Hashimoto's thyroiditis and also colitis and Crohn's disease, et cetera. So all I did was put it all together. And it's astounding to me that even today that the conventional message to cut your fat, eat more healthy whole grains persists when the exact opposite is true. So the conventional message is not just a little bit wrong, it's completely wrong. My mission is to try, as yours is, is to try to change this horrible tragedy called healthcare. And of course, it's bad in Australia, it's worse in the US. And in the US, Catherine, we pay $3 trillion a year, $10,000 per person per year, including infants and newborns, so it's more than that for older people, 18.8% of GDP, more than any other nation in the earth, yet we rank last in quality of health care among all Western countries. We're behind Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, France, uh, the Netherlands. We're behind all those countries in health care quality. People say, oh, American health care is the best in the, in, in the world. No, it's not. It's last. And it's the most expensive because, you know, big pharma takes advantage of this. We pay often twice as much for biologic drugs as other countries do because of the laissez-faire politics here. And so it's going to cripple this country. It's already crippled with a number of obese and diabetic and autoimmune people uh, in, this, in this country. It's getting worse. I don't know what the answer is except to say, you know, Ob President Obama tried to effect change. But all he managed to do was increase access, which is, which is good. But he tried to, his administration did try to restrain costs, but big pharma, the hospital lobby, the physician lobby, the, the um, medical device lobby, all were so effective because they contribute such money to Congress and the Senate that any change, any restraint in healthcare costs was batted down. So I'm not hopeful that we can affect change by top down by legislative change. So my answer is to try to affect change at the everyday level. Because I think if, if people are healthy, they don't need the healthcare system. That doesn't change the entire system, but at least it's a start. So my mission is to help people understand that you don't need prescription drugs, you don't need procedures, and that the health you obtain via these kinds of natural means is dramatically superior to the cheap excuse for health that the doctor can provide. One of the things that you said I really loved, and that was when I caused my type 2 diabetes, you know, and it's that people having that self-responsibility to know that they're actually causing what's going on for them. So they need to be proactive and be self-responsible. A good friend of mine, her mom uh, was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes just recently and was sent to a diabetes educator, a dietitian, And the diabetes educator gave her a diet that made her hemoglobin A1C skyrocket. That is the status quo, Catherine, where conventional health care is not only ineffective, it actually causes or contributes to disease. If you could give just one piece of advice to someone who wanted to make a shift in their health, what would that be? Get diet right, meaning ignore conventional dietary guidelines. Ignore them. Do not cut your fat. Do not cut your cholesterol. Do not consume healthy whole grains. Instead, Never restrict fat, never restrict calories, eat no wheat nor grains. And that alone, there's more to health than that, but that alone is a huge first step. And what I see happen is people say, I'll do the diet. And they say, well, I, gee, I didn't expect to lose 43 pounds in three months. I didn't know that my waist would shrink by six inches. I didn't know that my psoriasis would go away, etc." Then they say, well, gee, if Regaining health and slenderness was that easy. What else can I do? And that's where the door is open for all the other things we can do that restore health, youthfulness, vigor, uh, freedom from uh, health problems. So the, the big first step, uh, I think, is, is the wheat belly story that I told many years ago. That is no wheat, no grains. I love it. Thank you so much for your time. Sure, Catherine. It's been amazing. Dr. Davis covered quite a lot here, so let's make sure that we've gotten the key points and what actions you can take as a result of them. Number one, much of mainstream medicine is actually functioning as sick care rather than health care. 
The focus is on short-term fixes, medications and symptomatic relief, rather than addressing the root cause. For more on this, I recommend listening to episode 11 of The Shift, called Dysfunction in the Industry We Call Health. Number two. As we've been discussing a lot, wheat poses all kinds of problems for the body. It increases your blood sugar more than actual sugar, and it contributes to conditions like type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome. There's a lot more on wheat and gluten in episode 9 of The Shift, so I'd recommend taking a listen if you haven't yet. Number three. When you are presented with a chronic disease, lifestyle medicine should always be where you look, no matter if you are medicated or not. You might have remembered episode 17 with Dr. David Perlmutter, where we look at Alzheimer's in this context. Heart issues, diabetes and metabolic syndrome are all diseases of lifestyle that are largely preventable. Number four, don't wait for mainstream health to catch up to the latest science. I mentioned this in season one of The Shift, where it takes an average of 17 years for new research to get into your doctor's office. Advice given by GPs and the Dietetics Association is often very outdated and not based on the latest science. Learning is great, but doing is better. Here's my recommendations based on my conversation with Dr. William Davis. Number one, here it is again. Cut wheat out of your diet. It has little health benefit and has been associated with all kinds of problems. If you need more convincing, I'd recommend reading William's book, Wheat Belly, which is available in hard copy, Kindle and audiobook. Number two. If you're prescribed medication, do your research. Know what the side effects are and make a plan to approach the situation holistically. For this, the help of a good naturopath or an integrative medical specialist is invaluable so that you can make the right decision for you. Number three, begin to think about what you can do right now to prevent lifestyle diseases like diabetes and heart disease. We all have people that we love that are affected by these conditions, and it could be you next if you don't take action now. Dr. William Davis really is one of the most passionate health advocates I've ever met. Having lived and worked in the conventional medical field for so long, he can see the dysfunction and has chosen to do something about it. I'd highly recommend connecting with Dr. Davis on Facebook and visiting his website wheatbelly.com, where there is a heap of resources for you to make your shift. If you loved this episode, then please share it and tag both myself and Dr. Davis so that we know what you think. And of course, leave us a review. Your feedback helps me to give you what you need the most, as well as get us into the ears of more people. In the next episode of the Expert Series, I chat with Doctor of Chinese Medicine Nat Kringudis. You don't want to miss this one. Coming up on The Shift... So let's have a conversation about the, well, contraception in general, but the oral contraceptive pill in particular, um, and women going on it before they're sexually mature. One of the most fascinating things I learned in writing this book is that you know a young girl's hormones don't really find their, their way until around 18. Why do you think that we're so scared to tell our young women and our children like about normal physiology and how things work? I feel like at some point the conversation changed and became inappropriate. I hope you're loving the information in the shift as much as I do. But maybe you're thinking, what do I need to do for me? Take our online assessment to discover what your gut is up to. Go to theshiftclinic.com forward slash quiz.